Thank you, Janet. All right. Well, good morning to all you. As everyone's kind of getting situated, I got just, I'm going to kick off with a few announcements, change it up a little bit so people can, you know, kind of make their ways to their seat and not feel rushed. I'm going to give you some announcements. So communion, here recently I had mentioned that communion was something I thought let's do towards the end of each month at the last Sunday of the month. Got to thinking about it more and I understand this is how you guys did it in the past anyway. You would kick off the month with communion. So you would start that month fresh, taking communion, and it just would sort of start your month that way. And I think, you know, talking even with my wife about it and stuff, it just makes sense. So Amber's kind of like, hey, let's do it how you guys were doing. I think that makes more sense. So let's plan on next Sunday. Can you believe it's already going to be March tomorrow? Come on now. That's great. Ready for spring. So next Sunday, we will kick things off and we'll have communion. Um, Helen was very sweet, got things ready for me, but uh, let's, let's plan on that. Also, too, Janet and I were talking about Lent. I understand the past, historically, you guys would do something during Lent. You've lost your... I lost... Oh, you lost my thing. Well, my battery might be going. But in the meantime, so what I wanted to tell you was, I'm thinking for Lent this year, since we're already kind of in the middle of Lent, let's shoot for Holy Week having a special meal. Some more details on that. In the past, on Wednesdays during Lent, you guys would get together, but with COVID and everything, there's been less gatherings anyway, so let's plan on the last week during Holy Week doing something, if, if it all makes sense, we'll hope uh, to do that. So more details on that coming next Sunday, too. We have a very special Sunday planned. So next Sunday, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a devotional, and then in the service, there's many things that I want to present to you guys and share with you. We have our bylaws that I want us to vote on. I want us to also talk about children's ministry. I want us to talk about just some things for the upcoming few months of what we're going to be doing and just sort of looking at some plans. So next week, and I want to unfold our website. So all that next Sunday. So I hope you can be here next Sunday in service. Like I said, we'll be kind of confirming the bylaws. I'd like to also do some other um, things around our what we would call our deacons. Uh, so that's what you plan for next Sunday. So it should be, a ne- I would say, a very special Sunday next week. And with that, I'm going to let Janet take us away and lead us I in. I have a couple of announcements. Oh, you do too. Pie shells tomorrow morning oh, at sweet. 9 a.m. Cherry pies Thursday morning at 9 a.m. Okay. Ladies meet at our house Wednesday at 1 o'clock for the ladies group. (coughs) And we'll be having a a snack somewhere during the afternoon. Okay. So you heard that. I don't know if you did, but pies this week, Monday and Thursday, 9 a.m. Ladies group Wednesday, what time? 1. 1 o'clock be a snack. All right. Where are, the, where are you guys meeting? Here? Our house. Okay. Janet and Randy's. All right. <laughs> Is it said Janet that? and Randy's? Janet and Arthur's. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes. We have Janet and Arthur's house. This Wednesday, 1 p.m. All right. Now take us away, Janet, please.
faithfulness. Morning by morning, the seas I see. Well, good morning. good morning. So now we're going to take some time to see if anyone's got prayer requests or praise reports. Uh, looks like Charlotte's got the mic, so if you do have something, please raise your hand. She'll bring it around so people online can hear and everyone here can hear you as well. Anybody got a prayer request or a praise report? Looks like Randy does. Yeah. So those of, of us that have been up to some gospel know a group called Keepers of the Faith. And for those that aren't familiar, they're a group of American Samoans that lived a pretty rough life. They were in gangs and stuff, but now they they probably give the strongest witness and message up there. Hmm. They're doing a fantastic job. But Ace called me this week, the leader of the group, and he had severe COVID. He spent the month of December in the hospital, almost lost his life, and he's still really struggling. And their finances are really in dire shape. But most of all, we need to pray for, for Ace and his family and keepers of the faith. Thanks, Randy. I think, uh, Janet, do you have one? Charlotte, over here to Janet, please. Arthur and Leslie's sister, Linda Hirsch, has been suffering with COVID for the past two weeks. She's improved, but still got a long way to go, so please keep her in her prayers. Linda Hirsch. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, to request this, just a, kind of an announcement. New upper room, they're out on the... Oh, yep. In the Narthex there, so if anybody wants one, help yourself. Thanks, bud. All right. Well, I'm going to also just ask that we continue to lift up Keith uh, and, and Deneen and just uh, his healing. And so if we pray for them and uh, all these other things, that would be wonderful. Let's, uh, let's bow our heads and direct our attention to God. God, we are coming to you. You know the, the things on our heart. You know the things that maybe we didn't share this morning, but, um, but they're out there. Things that are, that are concerns with our own body, our family here at Shabona. God, there's things that people are going through that, that haven't been shared, things that maybe... Um, have been shared, but have been shared weeks or maybe a month or two ago, but they may still be dealing with those things. 
And so, God, we want to lift up past prayers to you, the ones that you know, God, need to still be addressed. Healing can take a long time, whether it's physical or emotional, spiritual. God, we pray for those past prayer requests that have been shared here, but maybe haven't been shared for some time. Work in the hearts and lives of those people. And God, for those who maybe haven't shared a real current need because of whatever reason, Lord, that they have, they want to keep this um, just between you and them right now, Lord, we lift up those needs to you. We pray, God, for healing and for hope and for peace in the lives of people right here in our congregation that need you to move in power, to see you present in their situations. God, we're praying for that. And we're praying, Lord, for these prayer requests this morning. Lord, we're asking that you be with Ace and his family in that ministry. God, we pray that you would provide. Lord, that you would give other people the information that they need to be able to help this family. And we pray, God, that he would get fully recovered from COVID, that he'd be back to his, his old self, so to speak. He'd be feeling better and, Lord, ready to continue to do the work that you have laid on his heart to do. And, Lord, we pray for Linda. We're glad to hear that she's improving, but, Lord, we just ask that you continue to work in her life, bring healing to her. And, Lord, we pray for, for Les. We pray for his leg. We pray for his foot specifically, Lord. We pray for healing in that specific part of his body. Strengthen him, heal him, God, we pray. And we ask, Lord, that you would be with Keith and Deneen, be with that family, Lord. Bring exactly what they need into that home. You know their needs, God. Bring healing, bring hope, bring encouragement, bring love. God, bring that into that home. And we pray, Lord, that you would just speak to us as we maybe get into this devotional that's now out for the new month coming up. That Bud reminded us is out there in the foyer. Lord, help us to grow as we read in devotionals, as we read in your word. Help us, God, to be more like you. And we ask, God, that you speak to us today as we look into your word and as we look into the the reality of our need for faith. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, here we are. We are in our study of Mark, and it is continuing. And I learned my lesson last week that that pencil does not want to stay up there when I'm preaching, so I'm going to put it down right now. Uh, we are in Mark chapter 5, so if you want to grab a Bible that's next to you or underneath the chair, uh, if you're following along like that, that's great. If you're using your phone to follow along, that's great too, as long as it's not tempting you to go in other places and just stick to uh, reading the Bible as we go along here in Mark 5. We are in Mark 5, and just a quick recap as we get into our study this morning, so... I'm going to get there and make sure I give you guys time to get there too. So Mark 5. So recap. It's believed that the author, we talked about last week, that the author is John Mark. He's referred to as John Mark in the book of Acts. So many scholars believe that this is the author of Mark and that John Mark obtained the majority of his firsthand information about Jesus through Peter. And the goal of this fast-paced theatrical narrative is to help the listener or the reader know who Jesus was and is. Chapter 1, we saw how Jesus amazed people. In chapters 2 and 3, we saw how Jesus made extraordinary statements. And last week, chapter 4, we focused on how Jesus wants us to listen. And this was emphasized in the parables that he taught, along with that quote that he shared from Isaiah. And Jesus warned all of us, really, that we need to make sure that the soils of our, the soil, I guess, the soil of each of our hearts is prepared to receive from him, to receive from his word. 
So that way our minds, our hearts are open to the things that God is speaking to us, both through the written word and through, of course, the Holy Spirit. We heard Jesus say last week over and over, he or she or those who have ears to hear, let them hear. So this week, chapter 5, we're going to look at how Jesus rescues two men. It's kind of a freaky and wild story, if you read ahead. Uh, these, these men were demon-possessed. It involves a herd of pigs getting possessed and running off a cliff. It involves people saying, Jesus, just get out of here. Don't, don't, don't stay in our area anymore. Chapter 6, we're going to look at how Jesus goes to his hometown. And he doesn't do a whole lot there. In fact, Jesus makes uh, the statement that, you know, you're honored everywhere but in your hometown if you're a prophet. We're going to see how faith played a factor in that. We're going to look at how Jesus sent out his 12 disciples to do some incredible ministry work. In the middle of all this is the tragic story of John the Baptist being murdered. And just after this, Jesus feeds 5,000 plus people. And then we're going to end our time by looking at that account of Jesus walking on water. Really, one could make the argument with everything that we're going to discuss today really deals with the topic of faith. It really comes down to that in these two chapters. And really, it's going to build off what we looked at last week, which is the theme that our hearts need to stay soft so that, we're going to see here, God can cultivate faith in our lives and that we can foster faith. Today, we're going to see or be reminded how faith is something that Jesus was and is both looking to develop in people as well as what we need to be putting into practice. We need to practice faith in our lives. And we're going to see how Jesus is always there to help us put faith into practice. He's going to give us opportunities to exercise our faith and he's going to challenge us so that we do live our lives in faith. Before we go to Mark 5, 1, though, I want you to read this with me in Matthew. So Matthew says this. This is uh, the same account of what we're going to see in Mark chapter 5 in the first few verses. But Matthew has a little bit more of some details. When he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, the Son of God? They, sh- they shouted, have you, come to hear- have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? And some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. This is an artist's interpretation. If you can see that all that well. Yeah, maybe Randy's going to jump up and kill the lights right above the projector screen. So this is James, uh, the, guy, the, uh, the artist's name is, I think, James Tissett. This is his depiction of what's going on here. So there's the two demon-possessed men. They're not clothed. They're kind of wild-looking, kind of freaky. And Jesus is standing there. So it's just one artist's interpretation of the account that we're looking at. Now, why did the, Arthur, why did the uh, artist paint the two men naked? Kind of weird. Maybe he just kind of had that in his mind. No, actually, Luke says that they weren't clothed. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. This Luke gives us some more details that Mark does not. Now, at this point, maybe you have caught, wait a minute, Luke says there's one guy. Matthew said there's two, right? Matthew said there's two. The artist paints the picture of two guys, but Luke says there's one. And in fact, so does Mark. That's why it's good when we're reading through the Gospels. I encourage you guys to do this last week. It's a reminder for me, when we read through the Gospels, usually your Bible will reference where the same story is found in the other Gospels. So we see this story is found in all three of what we call the Synoptic Gospels because they're so similar. 
Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have this story. But Mark and Luke only record one demon-possessed man. We're going to talk more about that. Mark 1, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes, which Jesus got out of the boat. Excuse me, when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For, isn't that freaky? Kind of freaky. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Do you think people liked this guy being in their town? I mean, you could just imagine how inconvenient this person would have been if you lived in this area. You're like, I'm avoiding that tomb or wherever he was at. I'm going to go the long way around because I don't want to run into this guy. It's freaky. Freaky guy. Running around. No clothes. <laughs> Screaming. Cutting himself. I mean, think about it. You would avoid this person. Now, you might have noticed, too, that there is a few different places being mentioned here. So I threw them up here. Where are we? Where are we, right? Because Matthew says, here, if you read this account, we're in the, the Gadarenes. Mark and Luke say we're in the Gerasenes. In, in fact, some ancient copies say we're in the Gerasenes. Where are we? What's going on? Dr. Craig Blumberg, professor of New Testament in Denver Seminary, who I think I've mentioned to you guys, I did meet this Blumberg guy. I'm sure he doesn't remember meeting me, but he was at our seminary as a guest speaker. So I got a chance to meet Dr. Blumberg, and he wrote that the best written evidence we have for both Mark and Luke, is that it's referring to the Gerasenes. Matthew, the best textual evidence we have is Gadarenes. Now what's going on here? Well, the cities of Gadara and Gesera were not cl close to the shore, but a small village about a mile from Gesera was. Now here, here's the deal. The Gadarenes is really more like a bigger region. It's capturing the region that this story took place. Gerasenes is kind of funneling down to more of a specific area. So they're not in conflict. They're just sort of talking about where this is located, either from a general sense of an area or more of a specific sense, like in the, in the city or the town, really, of Gesera. But the town of Gesera is kind of like the closest big town. So it'd be like something taking place in Shabona, but people mentioning that this happened in Cass City. Because it's just saying, hey, in the area of Cass City, this happened where this demon-possessed man was met by Jesus. But really, just outside of this area of Gesera was this town, this little village, actually. And it's where, you guys, this is modern-day Cursey, right here. So this is where they believe this took place. So just outside of our cast city in this small village was this place called Cursey, which would have been just outside of Gesera, in the region of Gatherings. Look at that. Can you see where you could find a steep slope there, right, for some pigs to run off of? This is modern-day Cursey in Israel right now. It's a modern-day picture. So you could go there and see where this took place, or where they believe it took place, based on the textual evidence. So if you're reading through the Gospels, and you're like, man, it's saying, you know, Gadarenes, Gagarasenes, Gagarasenes, what's going on here? That, I hopefully helped make sense. It wanted, I wanted to make sense of it as I was studying through it, too. Where are we as we're walking through our story? All right, so let's see what goes on here. So we just seen Mark 1 through 5. Jesus is confronted by... Two demon-possessed men, right? But Mark focuses on one. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? Notice the guy's response. Jesus asks this man 
who is demon-possessed, what is your name? And he responds, my name is Legion. Could you imagine? It's just freaky. Legion, he replied, for we are many. He's saying, my name is Legion. I'm, I'm possessed with many demons in me. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. Jesus responds, here we're going to see, there's a large herd of pigs, they're feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. That doesn't mean that there were 2,000 demons in this man. However this worked out, I'm sure there was enough demons that got into the pigs that then the pigs just got into a frenzy, and they got so freaked out that they ran over the steep cliff. Could you imagine if you were someone watching this or tending the pigs? I mean, you would have just been totally... Beside yourself, what in the world just happened? And we're going to see the response here of the community. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. I'm going to stop here for a moment. This is why I believe Mark and Luke focus on just one. There were two demon-possessed men. In Matthew's gospel, this story is very condensed. We don't get much of this information at all. But I think Mark and Luke focus on one and don't mention two because one of them appears to have stayed. It doesn't mean that Jesus didn't heal the other one. Two men were possessed. Jesus healed them. But one, it appears, sticks around. And there's more to the story with this one man. And so Mark and Luke want to highlight this interaction between this one person. He stood out among the two. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, told them about the pigs, and then the people began to plead with Jesus to do what? Get out of here. Now, this is too much. Here's this guy that's been demon-possessed, and there was another one, two of them. Now they're healed. This one's in his right mind, sitting here right now, we lost these pigs, just leave. This is all too much for us to take. They're literally telling God in the flesh, unknowingly, leave. And it's interesting when we think about that. Stop and think about these people, this is not a Jewish community, right? Because Jews would not have been raising pigs. So we know Jesus is in an area of Gentiles, non-Jews. These non-Jews, some of them see what happened. Some of them just get the report of what happened. And they just are like, this Jesus guy, you got to go. We're begging you, get out of here. This is too much. They're literally telling God in the flesh, leave. Church, I wrote down here, this is for me too. Let us all remember that God is in the business of interrupting routines and changing people's lives. All for the sake of bringing people into a personal relationship with him. God reaches out first like we've talked about. He extends grace to us and then we respond in faith or in a, in a form of lack of faith, right? Let's see how... The two contrast. So you got the people in that region of Gesera saying, get out of here, God. Unknowingly, they didn't know they were talking to God, but that's what they're doing. They're responding to Jesus and his miracles, in this case, and they're responding with a lack of faith. As Jesus was getting into the boat, this is such a bittersweet ending, isn't it? Jesus is getting into the boat. The man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Again, there's this focus on this one man who really seemed to change and get it. And it says here, Jesus did not let him. He's begging, Jesus, let me go with you. Jesus says no. He says, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. 
and how he has mercy or has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed at this man's testimony. God knows what's best, doesn't he? I mean, this, this story is bittersweet because here's this person who's been probably through so much pain and brokenness and demon-possessed, and now he's begging Jesus, let me go with you, and Jesus says no. And I, I put in my notes here, God knows what's best, not only for his own glory, but for our, our own lives. And he knew what would be best. Who knows the friendships the connections, the family relationships that he reconnected with or reunited with because he went back to his hometown. And imagine his testimony when he went back to the Decapolis, is, you know, I've talked about it here, uh, the 10 cities. He went back to this region where he was from and he's telling all these people, look what God has done for me. God knows what's best for his glory and for our lives. Who knows what has... What transformed in this man's life because God sent him back to where he was from? We can only imagine. Now, what's interesting here is we see two different perspectives on Jesus, don't we? We see here two different people or groups. We, let's say this. We have two demon-possessed men only one respond in, in the faith that we see here recorded in Mark and Luke. And then we see the people of Gesera. The people of Gesera plead. They beg Jesus to leave. We see the one man who was formerly demon-possessed beg to, for Jesus to essentially let him go with him. Two different groups, both begging. One begging Jesus to go, one begging Jesus to let him be with him. Isn't that interesting? Look how Mark does that. There's this juxtaposition here of these two groups. One begging Jesus to get out of here. One saying, Jesus, let me be wherever you are. Very interesting. We have this response of faith and, res and really a response of a lack of faith. Now, this really sets up um, a nice transition to our next section of the text. But before we go, I want to make two comments. There's two things I want to address about this story before moving on. Anybody ever read this story and get a little frustrated that Jesus let the demons go into the pigs? Anybody think that that's... I've heard people be very frustrated by this. Because they're like, really? I mean, what's going on here? I mean, that was someone's food, right? That's someone's livelihood. 2,000 pigs just went over the cliff. I don't think for a second that God would have ruined someone's livelihood just to make some cruel joke that Jews don't eat pork. Because I've heard that. Now, Jews hearing this story might have found it humorous. It's possible. But I don't think Jesus did this just to get some humor at all. Nor do I believe it lines up with the heart of God that he would have caused someone else to suffer just to prove the point that demons are only bent on destroying life. I mean, clearly that's what the demons did. As soon as they were allowed to go into the pigs, they immediately destroyed them. Interesting. So it does prove the point that Demonic activity is never for the good, right? I mean, it's a no-brainer, but it's a very evident or obvious lesson. Demons are only out to destroy. But I don't think Jesus did this just to make that point. God never does anything haphazardly. We must rest in the character of God as we dis see displayed, really, in all of Scripture as we make sense of this story. So my thought is, whoever lost these pigs probably experienced some minor setback in their wealth. Somebody who had 2,000 pigs probably were doing all right back then. So my guess is Jesus knew who, who was ever going to be impacted by this, it was a minor setback. Or down the road, God was going to make sure that they were 
unexpectedly blessed. We must rest in the character of God as we see in the entirety of Scripture as we make sense of this story. Second thing I want to point out about this account. It seems that in the Gospels, there's just all this demonic activity. And we don't see that today, really. What's going on there? It doesn't seem to match the world that we know and live in. So when people today are not in their right mind, they're prescribed medication and or they go see a counselor. Thus, demonic activity is just this archaic way of understanding what we know today as mental illness, right? Wrong. This would be an inaccurate understanding of what was going on back then as well as what's going on today. When I was a youth pastor this last time, so very recently when I was a youth pastor, youth pastor, I had a young man who was in high school. This is in Saginaw. I had a young man in high school here um, in Saginaw come to me, and he'd been having issues with his diet. And whatever he was eating, it seemed like with wheat or um, just gluten in general. He was having a gluten intolerance. But he felt like it was just, his exact words was like, man, Satan's just trying to get me down. And I said, you know, Sometimes that may be the case, but more than likely it has to just do, unfortunately, with, you know, what's been passed down to you from your parents. You know, this might just be something that you've developed or it might be something that now through stress or other things it's brought on, you know, this uh, insensitivity or rather this sensitivity to this food I said we can't say that everything that is bad in our lives or what's happening to us bad is a demon or Satan we don't want to do that scripture doesn't do that and we want to make sure that we're thinking biblically and not just say that whatever is bad in our lives it's Satan that wouldn't be accurate right because we live in a fallen world we are broken people ourselves and our bodies aren't the way God first intended them to be. Um, in fact, I want us to take I want to take us back to a scripture. It's important to think about. We looked at this in our very first week in Mark. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. The whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. We see here that the Bible differentiates between demonic activity and sickness. So when we get sick, we can't just say, man, Satan's trying to get me down. It's possible, right? I don't want to totally rule that out. The enemy might be trying to do something in your life. That's possible. But more than likely, it just has to do with just our own physical makeup. You know, I told the gentleman, I said, it could be your genetics. It could have been how the food's been prepared. It could have been a number of things. We can't, and the Bible makes that differentiation too. Jesus healed those who were sick, and he also healed those with demon possession. But let's talk specifically about how demon possession is viewed today. Because like I said, we can often think, well, today we just understand it as mental illness. But that's not the case There's a really good, because if we show a video, it just kicks us off. So when we're alive, if I showed this video, it would kick us off. I highly, highly recommend when you guys go home, go to YouTube. I'll put this on our Facebook link. John, just punch into YouTube, John Piper, have you exercised a demon? John Piper is a very well-known pastor in America, and he is not one who comes from that sort of hyper-spiritual church that, oh yeah, he was exercising demons all the time. He said that he had a very unique experience, but it was very real. It's a short, probably 10-minute video. It is certainly worth watching. It reminds us that the fact is The reality is Satan wants us to believe he doesn't exist. I think why we see more demonic activity in the first century is because people were just spiritual in general. They believed there was bad spirits behind everything. 
And so it didn't affect if whether or not people were going to disbelieve or believe in Satan. It had no issues. Today, the last thing Satan wants to do is draw attention to himself because that's really going to make people think, well, gosh, there's something beyond what I can see. But that doesn't mean that demonic activity isn't happening. In fact, Jesus, I think, helps us to know in these scriptures, in the gospel accounts, that what we see happening then and happening today is really behind the scenes unless it's been brought to the light through these scriptures. So today, I think demonic activity happens often, but Satan's very clever about making sure it isn't spread all over the news. There are too many stories, you guys. Too many stories, past and present. Christians, non-Christians, of people witnessing very eerie and unexplainable otherworldly encounters of the spiritual realm. That's just the truth of the matter. It doesn't take long to really go down this trail and find there is a lot of spiritual activity going on in the world. And it's pretty freaky. But we also know, as we see here, Jesus has the power over the demonic activity. We trust in God. So we don't have to be afraid or anything like that. But it does remind us that this is real. And, not to belabor this point, what we saw in this story is that the demons are really just seeking to destroy. Jesus said Satan came to do that very thing, to destroy life. And Jesus has come to bring life, life in abundance. So we want to keep that in mind. Now, as we go into the next section here, we're going to see how, like I said, I just want to touch on those two points. I highly recommend you go watch that video. I will have it on our Facebook page. But we see this transition and how it goes perfectly from those two stories, um, or the two uh, different groups. We had the people of Gesera pleading to have Jesus leave. We had the man who was formerly demon-possessed pleading to be with Jesus wherever he would be. And then we get to the other side. When Jesus had again crossed over the boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. And what did he do? He pleaded. You notice how Mark in this story, remember, it's very dramatic. It's very theatrical. He's moving this content forward. And we see pleading over and over, people pleading for Jesus to go, people pleading for Jesus to stay. We see a, a synagogue ruler going to Jesus and pleading earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. All right. So what we're going to see here happening is this sandwich technique. You ready for it? Mark did this a lot. Some of the other writers would do this. So we see here in this section of scripture, this sandwich technique happening. We have just met Jairus. He pleads to have Jesus come and heal his daughter. The meat of this sandwich, or the, maybe you don't like meat, so PBJ, so the peanut butter and jelly of this is there's this woman with bleeding who comes and touches Jesus as he's going to Jairus' house. And then the story wraps back up with Jesus healing Jairus' daughter. So you have this sandwich technique, which again helps to just create more suspense and drama and makes it more memorable, especially if you're listening to the story. So let's see what happens. So when Jesus had again crossed over, I'm going to pick it right back up to 24. So Jesus went with him. So Jesus is going with Jairus, and a large crowd followed him and pressed around him. Now before we go any farther, let me make sure you are aware of this. This is Matthew's account of the same story. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died. But that's not what Mark said, Jairus said, right? In Mark's account of this story, he said, my daughter is dying. In Matthew's account, the guy says, my daughter's already dead. What's up with that? Again, in this case, Matthew is condensing the story. There's very little details in this story at all. In Mark, we have all these details, including the woman who comes in the middle 
and gets healed by touching Jesus' clothes. And can you imagine, though, I, I don't think that's inaccurate here. I think there's a real simple way to make these work together. I think when we think about this, could you imagine Jairus? He's running from his house, and the last thing he knows is his daughter is on her deathbed. I mean, he knows he has no time. And he runs out. And you can imagine him going to Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, I need you to come and heal my daughter. She's dying. In fact, at this point, she's probably already dead. You can see both of those statements being made and how we can reconcile this. Where Matthew records the dead part. Mark is saying she's dying. You could see the dad saying, when I left, she's dying. And at this point, I don't even know. She could already be dead. So I think that's the idea of how we can reconcile these things. And so we see here, and by the way, Luke records that this is his only daughter. And I think every dad knows if they have a daughter, they have a special place in their hearts for their daughters. And so here is this man's only daughter. She's dying, and he's begging Jesus to come and heal her. Now, the crowd is following Jesus. You can imagine the chaos. There's a sense of urgency. I'm sure Jairus is just walking at a super fast pace, kind of pushing people aside a little bit as he's trying to get Jesus to his house. And a woman, we're told, verse 25, was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she'd heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Beautiful, right? I mean, think about a beautiful story. But could you imagine what Jairus is thinking right now, right as we get into this? At once, Jesus realizes that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? I mean, his disciples are even like, seriously, Jesus? There's people like mobbing all over you, man. How do, how do we know who touched you? It's kind of humorous. But Jesus knows. He says, no, seriously, who touched me? He keeps looking around to see. And then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. Remember that statement right there right there, trembling with fear, told the whole truth. We're going to get back to that. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Remember what our focus is today. This is building off last week. We got to keep the soil of our hearts soft so that we will receive God's word, what he's doing in his word. In this case, what he was doing through the word made flesh, Jesus through the Holy Spirit, what is God speaking to our hearts and are we responding in faith? He said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Could you imagine, like I said, what Jairus is feeling right now? I'm sure, like I said, he was just hot footing, right? You could just imagine, he was just moving fast. And he's like, seriously, this woman is stopping right now? What is she doing? We have to get to my daughter. And then there's this interaction between the two of them. Beautiful story, right? But if you were Jairus, wouldn't you be like, Jesus, come on. And then we see this. Verse 35, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead. Could you imagine? Why bother the teacher anymore? And overhearing what they said, Jesus looked at Jairus and he says, don't be afraid, just believe. Again, our emphasis is on, are we receiving God's word in faith? Is our heart soft, malleable? Is it ready to receive what God is teaching us or telling us? And are we going to respond in faith or a lack of faith? Clearly, Jairus, I think at that moment, takes a deep breath and says, all right, Jesus, let's go. I believe. And we see this story wrap up. Jesus goes into the house. He tells everyone, I want only the parents, a few of my close disciples. We're going to go and take care of this situation with no one else here anymore. Because there's a bunch of people in the house wailing and crying. And Jesus goes up and we're told here, he takes the little girl by the hand. And this is Aramaic. Talitha kum which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. 
Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. Notice here, what is her age? She's 12. How long had the woman been suffering with bleeding? 12 years. I don't know why that was put in their life. I mean, it's just an interesting thought. How also, the only time I think in the Gospels where Jesus calls a woman daughter, it's to the woman who had been suffering from her bleeding for 12 years. And now Jairus' daughter, who's 12, Jesus healed. There's a very interesting similarity between these two in this story. Beautiful, I mean, think about it. What a beautiful story that we have here of Jesus healing this woman who is a daughter of God and now this little girl, a daughter of a synagogue leader, Jesus heals. Beautiful. Now, like I said, there's this emphasis on belief over and over. Now, Mark 6, Jesus goes back to the town he grew up in, and people are offended at him. Has anybody ever been offended with you? I've had some people be offended with me, but Bud's shaking his head, yeah. Yeah, I've had a few people be offended with me before, and oftentimes, not always, sometimes they're offended because they misunderstood you. They misunderstood your intentions, right? Right? Well, here we see Jesus going to his hometown and they misunderstand him. In the past tense, right? They misunderstood what Jesus was doing when he went to his hometown. We see here Mark 6. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, among his relatives in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was, Jesus was what? Amazed at their lack of faith. This is substantiating our point this morning, isn't it? Are our hearts ready to receive from God? And are we going to respond in faith Or are we going to respond in a lack of faith? We're told here, they were offended. Like, wait a minute, Jesus, we know you. Your brothers are here. Your mom's here. There's your sisters. Where do you think you, you know, came from? We know where you came from. You're trying to come off, coming off, being all wise and have all these powers. Who do you think you are? And they responded with a lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Mark reminds us over and over how Jesus taught. He was a teacher, he was a teacher, he was a teacher. In Mark, um, 8 through 11, I just want to summarize. Um, In this next section, Jesus told his disciples, he tells his 12 disciples, I'm going to send you out two by two. And he says, I basically want you to be able to do the works that I've been doing. You're going to rebuke uh, impure spirits, But I want you to take the bare essentials as you go. Essentially, Jesus is telling his disciples, I want you to have faith in the power that I'm giving you, that I will work things out so that you'll be taken care of. Again, this argument that I'm making is every story in chapters 5 and 6 deal with faith. He's telling his disciples, you're going to go out and you're going to exercise demons And you're going to do this in faith. And by the way, take the bare essentials. You are going to trust me as I work things out in your ministry. This next section, Mark 6, 14 through 29, contains the very tragic story of John the Baptist being killed in prison. Now, John the Baptist was a great guy. I talked about him in our very uh, first, you know, study in this series. And... He was put in prison because he spoke out about what God says is right and wrong. And he told Herod, you shouldn't have your brother's wife when your brother's still alive. And it just, it was, what you're doing isn't good. And it was mainly Herod's wife that didn't like him saying that. And he found himself in prison. Question. How does this story of John the Baptist being put in prison relate to our 
topic this morning of faith. Well, I want us to go here and see something. This is in Matthew's gospel. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, this is John the Baptist, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Why is John the Baptist asking this question? You guys, John the Baptist is asking this question. He says, are you the Messiah or should we be expecting someone else? Remember, John the Baptist is the one who told everyone, there's someone coming after me that I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. John the Baptist was the one who baptized Jesus and saw the Holy Spirit descending on him and the heavens, you know, tearing open and this voice from heaven saying, this is my son, this is the same John the Baptist. He's now in prison and he's saying, hey, disciples of mine, can you go talk to Jesus and say, are you really the Messiah or should we be expecting someone else? Why is he asking that question? John the Baptist knew, but he was doubting and it's okay, right? Remember this whole topic today is on faith. Do you doubt? You don't need to raise your hand. Do you doubt at times, church? Yeah. And it's okay. John the Baptist is doubting right now. Because he's saying, Jesus, if you are who you say you are, and I believe who you are, why haven't you got me out of prison? Right? And Jesus responds, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Jesus doesn't, I don't think, want to seem harsh here. Again, this can seem like it might be like, well, gosh, that's a harsh response, Jesus. But Jesus is just saying, hey, John, you know the scriptures that spoke about me. And you know that in Isaiah, it said the Messiah would come and do these things that I am doing. So trust in me. Keep trusting me. And just after this, in Matthew, Jesus goes on to give John praise. So we know that this isn't a real harsh response. He's just encouraging John. But here's the deal. If there was ever a time, I would think, in human history where God would have intervened in someone's life, you would have thought it had been right now, right? And John and Jesus were close relatives of some, of some sort, right? Mary and Elizabeth John the Baptist's mom, they were relatives. We know, so here is a relative of Jesus. He's a forerunner to Jesus' ministry. He is a great prophet. He's in prison, and he's asking Jesus, essentially, where are you? Why aren't you interceding in my situation? And we don't see it happen. And in Mark's gospel, in chapter 6, we see how Jesus doesn't intercede and that John is killed in prison. Our prayers aren't always answered, are they? We see things happen in our world. And we're like, why, God, did you let that happen? Why did you let that person pass away? Why did you let those events unfold like that? We see this happening in our life, and we wonder where God is. John the Baptist was wondering where God is, but this is my belief that John continued to trust in God and that God was at work in the world, even though in his own present circumstances, he couldn't see it. And that they weren't changing. I don't want to take you there yet. Um, I'm going to summarize this next section here for you. Uh, Mark 6, 30 through 42, basically Jesus, right after this uh, story of John the Baptist, he arrives at this quiet, remote place, but the multitude of people have come to find him, and the people are gathered around, and they're wondering, um, his disciples are wondering, hey, what are we going to do about them, because they've been here all day, and they're going to be hungry. 
Now, this is one of the only stories that is in all four of the Gospels. So we're going to see here that in John's Gospel, so this is the story of Jesus feeding 5,000 plus people with some bread and some fish. So John's Gospel records another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? And we see that Jesus here then multiplies the bread and the fish to the point where the apostles, at the end of this story, gathered Jesus' uh, leftovers that he had multiplied. And notice here that they gathered them. Um, oops, I took you back. Notice that they, when they gathered them, the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls. How many disciples were there? There's 12, right? So we see that 12 disciples each had a basket, each one of them, of the 12, and they went around and they picked up the leftovers. I mean, talk about an opportunity that God created to increase their faith. Now, just after this, we see this next story here. Jesus immediately made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while well, he dismissed the crowd. And after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. I didn't want to skip over this for two reasons, really quickly. One reason is when we're talking about faith, focusing on faith, we need to remember we need to pray. Faith is not cultivated without a prayer life. And we see that Jesus himself prayed, we need to pray. And then we see also here, Jesus is giving these guys a little bit of rest. If you've ever been, you know, to a big conference or something and someone wants to talk to the guest speaker, right before this story, Jesus told his disciples, you need some rest. And that day they did get some rest. They probably sat in the sun, listened to Jesus speak. At the end of the day, they go and they, they uh, of course, feed Jesus, you know, multiplies the loaves, the fish. They feed them and then this is their last little bit of rest. They get to you know, be sent on their way without having to dismiss the crowd. But the rest doesn't happen for long because then they're found uh, back on the water. I don't know if you can see this one very well, but this is an artist's depiction of Jesus walking on the water. So in the middle of the night, Jesus prays. As he's praying, then he gets up and he goes to connect with the disciples. But it appears in the text he's going to walk right by them, right? If you read ahead, it kind of seems like Jesus is going to walk right by them. And as he walks by, they think... He's a ghost. And at that point, Matthew's gospel records some additional details. That's when Peter says, if it's you, Lord, let me come out of the boat. Les, was it you that referenced this last week? Yep. So, of course, this all has to do with faith, right? So here we see Peter saying, Jesus, is that really you on the water? Let me come out. And Jesus says, come on. Come on out. And when he does, at some point, though, he takes his eyes off Jesus he lets his fear get the best of him and begins to seek. And Jesus, of course, catches him. And I'm sure very lovingly, I can just imagine him saying, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? You did so well. Ask him to come out and see me, to get out of the boat. Just emphasizing faith over and over. So I want to wrap things up with just a couple of thoughts. And I'm going to do it by taking us to this passage here. So Jesus climbs into the boat with them. And when the wind died down, they were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. You guys with me here? Just about done. I understand that faith is hard. When we talk about faith, it can be something that it's just almost like a theory. Oh, faith. But then when we live our lives, faith's hard. Actually practically living out our lives as faithful Christians or faithful followers of Christ is hard. And so there's this theory side and then there's the practical side. And I feel like what we need to remember on the practical side is we just read Jesus climbs into the boat. He's done all these things. He just did this miracle of multiplying the loaves and the fish, the the disciples each picked up a basket full of all this. They've been seeing all these things that Jesus has done. And yet their hearts were hard. Now it doesn't mean when someone's heart's hard that it's always going to be hard. But for whatever reason, they weren't responding in faith like they should. It reminds me of what Proverbs says. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. We need to guard our hearts. We need to make sure that the soil of our hearts are soft and to be able to receive God's word. 
and what he's wanting to do in our lives. This will allow us to do what God says in Hebrews eleven six, which I referenced last week. We want to please God. But in order to please God, we've got to have faith. Even if it's just a little bit of faith, we've got to please him with faith. So we need to exercise that faith. So to wrap things up, I just want us to encourage, I want to encourage us with this. Faith is paramount in the Christian life. And I, I hope that Mark chapter 5 and 6 serve as great reminders to all of us that Jesus provides opportunities still today, just like he did back then, for his followers to trust him more and to better understand who he was and is. So let's pray with that thought going forward that God is still giving us opportunities to help us to grow in faith. Let's pray. God, we need you. We need you to, to work in our lives. And, and I recognize my need for you. Lord, we pray that you would help us to grow in faith, that we need to recognize that you are giving us opportunities to grow in faith. And Lord, we need to make sure our hearts are soft so that we can respond in faith as those opportunities come to help us grow closer to you, to help us to trust in you, help us to better understand you. God, I pray you just continue to speak to our hearts today about what your word has to say about you. And Lord, we just ask that you would just be with us this week. Help us to be good witnesses to you. Help us to practically live out our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, thank you guys very much. Um, enjoy.